You're listening to Paz de Chipotle. I'm your host, Rocio Carvajal, food anthropologist, Mexican culture, and gastronomy educator. And through this podcast, I explore the gastronomic traditions and cultural history of Mexico. You can find more information about these and my other podcasts, lectures, food tour, and publications on the description of the show. Or better yet, you can subscribe for free to my newsletter, which I only send when every new episode is released. Hello and welcome back to the show, just in time after my favorite festive season, which is Dia de los Muertos. And of course, this is a good time to invite you to explore the podcast's large archive, where you will find themed episodes um, like uh, several on the Day of the Dead, Cinco de Mayo, Independence Day, and many, many more. I have been excitedly working ahead to today's episode that features a long-awaited conversation I had with historian Dr. Pablo Miguel Sierra, who has a vast expertise in colonial Latin America, African diaspora, Black Mexico, and of course, ethnohistory, among other areas. And as the title of this episode suggests, Afro-Mexico, the untold story of slavery in colonial Puebla, we are going to take a deep dive into a little explored topic, which is slavery in Mexico. The challenges of archival research, strategies for piecing together the history of racialized minorities whose paper trail is at the best of times scattered and at the worst is simply non-existent. And we will also discuss the incredible history of an amazing couple of an indigenous noble woman and an Afro-descendant slave who became powerful members of the Poblano colonial elite. Earlier this year, I published here on the podcast an episode called Afro-Andalusi Culinary Legacy in Mexico, in which I presented an introduction into the history of African and Asian slavery, also immigration, and the multi-ethnic society of colonial Mexico. Now, the main point of interest of that episode was the focus on the cultural footprint of the Muslim rule of the Al-Andalus in the Iberian Peninsula and its impact in colonial Mexico, which allowed me to set a complex historical and cultural landscape that I hope to continue exploring through different lenses. It is estimated that between... 1525 and 1866, there were at least 36,000 documented transatlantic trips between West Africa and the Americas that transported around 11 million people. The key here is documented, because even when slavery was not only legal, but it was regulated by the Spanish regime, illegal slave trade was also a common practice. While the slave trade primarily aimed to speed up the production and extraction of colonial commodities such as sugarcane, tobacco, cotton, and of course the mining industry, as Dr. Sierra's own work proves, enslaved African people and their descendants also participated in the colonial economy through many other activities. However, the urban presence of enslaved people tends to be dissolved in the invisibility of the spaces and activities that they were forced to do. And as we know too well, historical narratives tend to only serve very specific interests and agendas, painting a much more um, gentler and sanitized version of things. And this is precisely one of the main contributions of Pablo's work that highlights the importance of bringing decolonial perspectives into historical research to give voice and presence to otherwise invisibilized groups. <laughs> 
To finish up this introduction, let me tell you a little bit more about my guest. After completing a BA in History and Latin American Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, Pablo went on to pursue a master's and a PhD in history at UCLA. Dr. Sierra is now Associate Professor of History at the University of Rochester in New York, where he teaches courses on colonial Latin America, the African diaspora in Latin America, the other Atlantic ethno-history, memory and chronicle and Black Mexico, among other classes. Dr. Sierra is a busy man indeed, and his efforts really don't go unnoticed, as he is one of this year's three recipients of the Gurgen Award of Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching from the University of Rochester. Pablo is the author of Urban Slavery in Colonial Mexico, Puebla de Los Angeles, 1531-1706, published by Cambridge University Press in 2018. And he's published many book chapters and conference papers. Among other projects, he's currently involved with Mexican Atlantic contraband captivity and the 1683 raid on Veracruz. And that is one project I definitely want to follow up. Finally, I want to thank uh, Mika Rajanov, fellow PhD candidate from the Boston University and all-around lovely person with an impeccable podcast taste who introduced uh, Pablo Sierra and myself to our respective work and we immediately got excited about planning a collaboration. Fast forward a few months and here we finally are. Thank you, Micah. So, without any further delay, let's get on with the show. I hope you enjoy this episode. Pablo, it's a true pleasure to have you on the show. And I want to start by saying how important your work is, as it helps us examine and rewrite many aspects of the social and cultural history of our city, which is, of course, the beautiful city of Puebla, Mexico. And since, well, we will be exploring how the African slave trade is tied into the economic success and social dynamics of this region in the colonial context. I would like you to give us an overview about Puebla's participation in this activity, that is the slave trade. How long did this last and how big did the enslaved population was? And, you know, which were kind of the demographic features of this group? Were they mostly men or women? So, uh, please, uh, go ahead. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you so much for this for this kind invitation. And yes, um, this is a huge, huge uh, element of um, Poblano history, but I, I would also contend that Mexican history in general. So in the case of Puebla, we have indirect evidence of enslaved Africans in the city since 1536. And um, that's when a mun municipal government establishes different types of punishments for city residents. And so this is true of black people, of native people, of Spaniards. So we can say 1536 for sure. That's when it begins. The last cases of enslavement I have found take place all the way up to 1801. So we are talking about the entirety of the colonial period. Unfortunately, there's no reliable census for, for Puebla or for most other locations. Sometimes civil authorities or religious authorities record the number of free people in Puebla, which included those of African descent. Other times they lump all non-Spaniards together and all non-natives together. So it makes for a very difficult kind of analysis. Based on my research, I estimate that people of African descent in Puebla accounted for 20, um, for 10 to 20 percent of the city's population during the colonial period. And we can say that that African population is largest, is most conspicuous and most influential in the 17th century. Now, when we're trying to determine what did that population look like, how could we characterize them, 
we could say that when transatlantic slaving networks are most active, so we can say between 1590 and 1640, that you would have much more men in the city um, than women. So slavers typically bring in two African men for every African woman. However, right, we have to understand that Puebla being such a large urban center had an immense demand for enslaved domestic labor. So what that means is that women were very, very numerous in elite residences and convents. By 1700 or so, um, however, you have more of a gender balance. So as there's less transatlantic slave trading and natural reproduction takes over, you tend to have one man for every woman um, of African descent. But of course, we, we would have to look specifically at the kind of spaces, neighborhoods, and communities because there's, there's a great deal of uh, a flux in those spaces. Just for context, for, for people who are not that uh, acquainted with, with Puebla's history, the establishment of the colonial period and like the, the Spanish regime uh, occurred in 1521, right, with the fall of uh, the, the, the great imperial capital of Tenochtitlan. And that is like the starting foundation of the city of Mexico. Puebla was founded in uh, 1531, so 10 years later. And you're telling us that the uh, evidence of enslaved African people in Puebla started as early as 1536. So just five years into the history of Puebla, which is pretty much like you say, from, from the very beginning. And let us also be very clear that well-documented evidence is, of course, you know, your, your primal resource to establish all these. That does not imply that there would have been activity of this kind even before, right? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely correct. And what we have to understand also is you mentioned, you know, the fall of Tenochtitlan and the foundation of Mexico City. So there would have been... Uh, enslavement already in place in in Ciudad de Mexico, right? So even though the first indirect evidence is 1536, we would have to understand that enslaved people of African descent always uh, resided in Puebla and always um, worked in that specific space. Well, that takes us to, to the fact that, you know, the historiography, which is, you know, how history has been uh, studied, you know, of how the African presence has been documented in Mexico. It had a really, really slow start and it was kind of rough and patchy. And it's mind-blowing to think that only as recent, you know, in the 20th century, in 1946, the first proper specialized research on this subject was published by uh, Gonzalo Aguirre Beltran under the name of Black Population in Mexico. So this was like a fundamental document that you know, in many ways, almost single-handedly opened up a whole new field of research known as uh, Afro-Mexican studies. I mean, of course, since then, many others have followed. Uh, but even 60 plus years later, still remains a vastly underexplored subject, as uh, authors like Ben Vincent and Bob Boham have noted in the book Afro-Mexico. And of course, of course, you have made that very, very clear that the case of, you know, blackness is decisively a very foreign concept in Puebla's own cultural history because acknowledging the presence of black people in colonial past uh, implies an acknowledging of our role in the slave trade and it also becomes very uncomfortable you know to talk about the challenges of, of you know of uh, contesting a well-ingrained uh, local identity in Puebla of idealized, punished, white stereotypes. So what was awaiting for you when you started digging under the shiny surface of the Baroque glamour and splendor that covers Puebla's history? <laughs> no, right. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great question because um, living abroad, one mentions Puebla and immediately there's references to Mole and to the beautiful convents and churches and the Zócalo, our, our main plaza. And um, yes, unfortunately, the history of slavery is, is very real to the city and certainly uh, complicates and certainly puts a damper on some of this celebration of, of the Baroque. 
I'll, I'll give you some context. My first day in Puebla's notarial archives, I had no idea what I was going to find. There was no catalog at the time. And so when one enters that archive, one simply asks for a year and a box number. So I requested a box for the year 1600. And I was stunned to find a complete ledger of sales for enslaved people that was simply um, there on catalogs, sitting in a box. I remember putting my hand in, right? And, and, and these, these brown pieces of paper come out and the, the handwriting is quite difficult. So I sat down with it and I said, okay, that, there's one document there for a, for a slave transaction and let's see what the next page is. And it was the same for a different person and for a different person and for a different person. And I realized, wait, I, I haven't even started. I don't have a research method. And yet there's this overwhelming evidence of enslavement. So, so in that first day, I, I came to realize that this Baroque glamour was going to go away, right? That what I was finding was an immense, disorganized and dehumanizing archive of African enslavement. And uh, overall, I spent three years in, in those particular archives, and I only scratched the surface. I only was able to document about 20% of the records for a 100-year period, which is to say that the history of enslavement, but also of a deeper African diaspora, an African diaspora that also is significant for its free families, right, for its entanglement with indigenous people, with Spaniards, with mestizos, with Asian people, that that entire history had not yet been explored. So that was a very humbling realization um, to, to, to come upon in 2007 um, when I realized, my goodness, uh, we know so, so little. In, in, in Mexico and Puebla, we have this phrase, estamos en pañales, right? yeah. we're in diapers. <laughs> We're like babies in diapers. We truly don't understand our history yet. And so that idea has been a motivation and a constant challenge to, to yeah. do more. It also you know, begs the question, why was the silence? I mean, not only, not only like, uh, you know, the fact that maybe no one found it. Yeah, I mean, but then like, why there's no, there's no place for these other nests? Uh, in 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 the everyday history, but we're gonna we're gonna go into the details little by little. But you know, I sort of feel this uh, very uncomfortable feeling uprising in me, like starts bubbling. Like you know, it's nothing is casual, and in history, there's many decisions taken in how and what and when and who records our history, right? So there's nothing casual. Oh, having said that, uh, and, and into the challenges of critical historical research, you're not only questioning, like we say, the meaning and the origin and the value of documentary evidence. At the same time, you have also been attempting to change and at least, you know, or beginning, you know, when you first started, question our present day assumptions and attitudes towards our past. Like, why has this never been? discuss why no one is you know going on about this so i really oh, it really got my attention the level of detail you go into your work when you talk about the power of racial categories and naming and the social weight of terms such as pardo mulatto moreno and other words that were used to describe that you came across these documents uh, referring to enslaved and freed african and afro-descendant people uh, these, of course, are categories that emerged within a very specific caste system, where all individuals, not only uh, you know African people, but everyone in the colonial society, were classified and identified under very specific groups and stereotypes. So, can you help us understand this linguistic universe uh, and how these different terms and categories were important for that society, and how people actually learned to play with those same classifications to their advantage? Right. So, yeah. So, so in response to that, I, I would say that I, first I take inspiration from the work of Michel Rostruyot, this, this brilliant Haitian intellectual who has a theory on 
uh, the production of history and the power that is embedded in in who produces history and how they produce history. And, and, and the foundation is, you know, when do we create documents? How are documents created? And then there are other stages. How do we access them? How do we write histories? How do we produce history in the, in the final instance, which he calls the moment of retrospective significance? And so my approach is to document as much as I possibly can, um, even if it's painful, especially if it's painful, in order for us to start building archives, narratives, and histories. Uh, so when we're talking about these labels, of course, we understand that it's the enslavers that are creating the labels for the Spanish imperial archive. In the case of Africans, we know that immediately upon disembarkment in the port of Veracruz, those those Africans who survived the Atlantic crossing were immediately labeled. They were called bozales, meaning that they were unaccustomed to Spanish culture, language, and perhaps some were unfamiliar with Catholicism. And they were also labeled as negros or negras, which referred evidently to their to their skin color. But that term of negro negra was very, very strongly associated with enslavement in the 16th century and then obviously again in the 17th century. So what we see in Puebla is that as those individuals survive colonial violence, as they adapt to this new cultural environment, they they negotiate, they navigate, they form alliances, and some of them end up having families. And so in a generational process that's quite slow, these black families start to embrace other labels. So free black men and women will often claim to be morenos or morenas, which still marks them as dark-skinned people, but not as enslaved people, not necessarily. And so we can see these kind of tensions between a notarial document, which is a transaction, or a baptism or a marriage document in which there's more self-identification. And so we see black families starting to say, no, 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 I am Moreno Libre. I'm a free Moreno person. And there is trying to establish a distance between that debasement that is uh, slavery. And the same is true for people who claim uh, this identity of parda or pardo, which means brown, right? It's important to understand they're not denying their ancestry. They're not trying to whiten themselves out of a category. They're establishing their belonging to those communities, but they're looking for alternatives. So they're rejecting terms like mulata or mulato, and they're claiming self-respect through concepts like parda and pardo. And we see this also among the free-colored militiamen who are very, very conspicuous in the colonial period um, and who become very influential actors in the 18th century, they want to be respected as people of African descent who have earned their freedom, right? who deserve to be free and for future generations to be free. So choosing those labels is a strategic choice that they make. It's not accidental, and we can trace those kind of decisions in the archive. So in many ways, you're telling us that uh, is the case of them building their own agency, uh, so acknowledging their their racialized identity, but also cashing in on the fact that under whichever circumstance they achieved freedom. And they're owning that and they're letting people know that they own their agency. So uh, it's an empowering self way to categorize. Am I right? That's, that's absolutely correct. And there's often tension, right? One person will say, I'm a Moreno Libre. And in another document, a uh, Civil authority will say, no, 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 that's, um, that's a negro. And the, and the free person will once again say, yes, my name is Juan de la Cruz, but I'm a Moreno Libre. So, so that tension plays out simultaneously sometimes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. It's, uh, well, paramount you know, for, for anyone who is either reading this, your research and contemporaneous research to understand what it means. When, when these terms come out. We're going back to sort of these, how these notions and how these identities are built and, and deconstructed and resignified, when we uh, often, you know, talk in history a- a- about um, 
uh, this diaspora and where they come from, we always said to do it in very abstract terms when we refer to Africa, you know, as a place of origin, which is a whole, you know, continent of the, you know, the, this place of origin of millions of people who were enslaved and transported uh, into the Americas, you know, regarding our own history. And on occasion, we hear references uh, that talk about West Africa, you know, just war for some still very, very broad geographical context. Now, and you have come across key information about the geographical origin and very specific ethnic groups of certain enslaved and free Afro descendants that lived in colonial Puebla. Uh, can you tell us more about your findings and what kind of research can we be looking at in the future if we continue exploring this cultural, geographical and genetic information? Right. So, so Puebla has a very, very strong connection to the port of Luanda, Luanda in, in Angola. Um, and, and Luanda was the primary um, port for, for the slave trade during the 17th century. And so what this means is that Puebla, like most of Mexico, is very deeply connected to West Central Africa, to, to that very large region. So if, if we're a little more specific, we can say that the modern day nations of Angola, the Republic of Congo and the Democratic Republic of Congo um, are entwined with Mexican history. When, when we are looking at the, the raw sources, the most common references, these are ethnonyms, we use this concept of ethnonym, um, that associate with the people that are being sold, they're most often labeled as Angola people. Congo people or Anchico people. And these were groups that were active in the Kingdom of Congo, a little bit um, in inland also, um, around Matamba and Ndongo. And so there are many scholars, Africanists, brilliant Africanists, like Linda Haywood and John Thornton, uh, Joquinaldo Ferreira and others who have dozens of studies on this cultural region, which they call the M Mundu Cultural Region, M-B-U-N-D-U, Mundu Cultural Region. I should also say there is also an important group of Arara people, A-R-A-R-A, -A -R -A, Arara people, who originated in the African states closest to the Gulf of Guinea, especially around modern-day Benin and Togo. So if we engage the kind of genetic testing that we see nowadays, um, we, we may find some problematic results. But what we should know is that there is a clustering of people from West Central Africa and that we would expect to find higher levels of incidences of those genetic markers uh, along the coast of Veracruz today. Um, of course, also in Guerrero, along, along the Pacific coast. And in certain communities around the city of Puebla, like Izúcar or Chietla, we would expect to see larger um, evidence of um, African genetic information in, in those kinds of communities. Uh, just, 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 again, um, explaining why these uh, sort of belts uh, around the city and, and, you know, that became sort of clusters uh, where these people were um, concentrated in, in, in larger uh, groups is because uh, it's precisely in these belts where the... Um, Sugar cane and also a little bit of cotton industry occurred, so that 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 explains why they were there, at least here in this region. I mean, it's a kind of a tough topic. Uh, we know, of course, that during the the period of the colonial regime, there was also enslavement of indigenous people. You know, that ended up being sold as slaves. So that's how also we can explain the presence of indigenous people. Uh, in Europe, of course, uh, and also in Asia, during, uh, following the Trans-Pacific Trade Route, can we be looking also at some genetic presence of indigenous people in the Angola larger region as well? You think? So uh, I think I think that's a little more um, challenging because what I understand is that there are movements of indigenous people from the Americas to the African continent in the early modern period. But f from what I've been able to understand is that those are mostly Brazilian populations, native Brazilian uh, Tupi 
people who form part of colonial armies that are sent in the 1630s and 1640s to fight wars for the Portuguese crown. And so they, they arrive in significant numbers. I'm not sure that's the case for uh, Mesoamerican populations, for Central Mexican populations. Nancy Van Dusen, for instance, has a wonderful book called Global Indios, and she tracks the movement of enslaved Native American people um, from Spain, from Chile, from Peru, who end up in Spain. And so we see a concentration there in, in Iberia, um, but not so much in, into, into Africa itself. Okay. Oh, oh, well, I'm going to make sure to put that book uh, in the list of recommended uh, material, of course. This is just fascinating thing, you know, how can we retrace as Mesoamericans were descended from Mesoamericans, our presence in this, in this um, period, uh, global presence, that is. Just to wrap up this first segment where we're sort of presenting this big overview uh, of uh, slavery in Puebla, I think it's really fascinating the way you have integrated in your research the spatial and urban aspects of, uh, of your work by identifying specific places in the city of Puebla where key activities took place that were linked to uh, uh, enslavement, um, you know, like the types of trade uh, where they uh participated, the neighborhoods where they lived, where they worked, their domestic environments, the workshops and, and uh, you know, different types of trades, and also even religious spaces where they would have uh, interacted uh, among themselves and with the rest of society. Can you expand a little bit more about your interest in, in sort of bridging uh, territorial studies and, and urban studies? And what does that tell us, these, these, you know, mixing ethno history through this perspective? What can we find in, in, about the Nepal Hispanic society and their attitudes towards race and the use of urban spaces? Right. So uh, the first thing I would say is that sometimes, um, depending on where you live, you, you may associate slavery with a rural setting, right? With a plantation, with... Um, I teach in the United States, so, so slavery is very closely associated with, with cotton slavery, for instance. And what I tell my students is that they need to understand that the urban dimension of slaveholding in New Spain was was really powerful. Um, and it's not something that one encounters in every uh, colonial society, but it certainly was true for colonial Mexico. So a as I was researching my first book, I kept finding references to enslaved people in convents and in textile mills. Uh, those were called obrajes. And essentially they were enclosed spaces where intensive textile manufacturing was taking place. So the more I, I studied and understood the daily lives of those people, I came to realize that their lives must have been so radically different from those um, enslaved uh, people who were sent to sell food in a marketplace or who traveled extensively to Oaxaca, to Veracruz, to Ciudad de Mexico. That must have been a very different daily life. And I had not quite understood the significance of that spatial reality. So what I did in my book is I started to center on um, what life must have been like for an enslaved girl or an enslaved woman in an elite convent, right? And that gave me a new understanding of this entrenched demand for domestic servitude in the holiest of spaces, right? Convents are supposed to be sacrosanct cities within cities in which Catholicism thrives. But when we center the experiences of enslaved women in those spaces, well, then we realized, no, they're also active participants in the transatlantic slave trade, in local slave markets. And so that came to tinge how, how I thought of city, the city and its relationship to slavery. Something that's important to understand is that we, we often also gender slavery, right? We, we tend to think that men are enslavers. But when we think of um, the context of the female convent, well, then we realize that, well, no, Spanish women, whether they were born in Iberia or born in, in Puebla or Ciudad de Mexico, they also came to demand and expect this, um, this enslavement. Uh, in, in previous episodes of the podcast, uh, I tangentially touched on uh, slavery in religious spaces. Uh, it never ceased to shock me. And I, I'm just 
I just want to make sure that what everything that you just said about centering in the holiest of, of spaces, in that matrix of the you know way of thinking uh, uh, and the social order of the religious uh, Spanish society, slavery was present. Yes, yes, yes. That's correct. No, it's, it's correct. And it is jarring. It's jarring because we tend to think of, of nuns and, uh, you know, they make candy, uh, they make pastries, they lead, um, really, um, humble lives, most of them today in the 21st century. But in the colonial period, there, there is a lot of privilege in, in the colonial convent as well, right? These elite convents um, concentrate the daughters of the most powerful merchants and politicians of the colonial period. And these are women that, when they were not in the convent, were, were serviced by dozens of enslaved people in their houses. So that cultural expectation could not simply disappear. It simply transfers into a different space, which is the convent. And... This is troubling to us because we think of women like Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, right? We think of these brilliant intellectuals that we associate with feminism and early modern feminism, as it were. But they are, but they are participants in these larger slaving economies. And that, that should challenge us. And when we walk down the beautiful streets of Puebla and we go by the Convento de Santa Rosa we need to think about what that meant for those who were enslaved. It is, a challenging, um, it is a challenging question, but I think it's an important one if we're going to be honest to, to their reality and also to, to the legacy of that religious infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, 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 and to pay these debt that we owe them, to, to bring their voices back uh, and, and to have their stories heard. It's our duty, either cultural historians, culinary uh, historians, or any any engagement with history and heritage. I, I, I don't think there is any field of study that, that should not acknowledge uh, our past in, in its, its full complexity. Now we're going to enter one of your case studies, uh, which was actually my first contact with your research. Uh, and it was this fascinating paper uh, that you shared with me called From Chains to Chiles, an elite for indigenous couple in colonial Mexico, which explores the story of an incredible poblano couple uh, of a man called Felipe Monzón y Mojica and his wife, Juana Maria de la Cruz. And I would rather let you introduce us to them. So tell us who, who were they and when did they live? Right. So Felipe Monzón was a man of African descent and Juana Maria de la Cruz was an indigenous woman. Their childhoods are a bit of a mystery to us. We know that they were alive and well in the mid 17th century, in the 1640s and 1650s. We think they met in the San Jose parish, which is just north of Puebla's main plaza and cathedral. And that was a very mixed neighborhood. There was an incredible diversity of, of populations, um, not just ethnically, but also in terms of the occupations, who, who worked and, and lived in San Jose. It wasn't quite the elites, but there was a little bit of everything, right? There were master artisans, um, there were weavers, there were towel makers, there was all sorts of, of people in, in San Jose. We know that when uh, Felipe and Juana Maria meet, uh, that he was still an enslaved person. Unfortunately, we know nothing about his ancestry. We don't have the name of his parents. All we know is that he was owned by a powerful family, the Higueras family, who had extensive contacts with sugar plantations in, in central Veracruz. Um, Juana Maria, on the other hand, was the daughter of a prominent native family who lived in the city of Puebla. She never claims to be a cacica or India principal. In other words, she may have hailed from the indigenous nobility of Tlaxcala, which was an indigenous city-state very close by, but she never claims that nobility if she, if she did, in fact, belong to those families. The larger point is that the two would eventually marry and Juana Maria would purchase Felipe's freedom papers. 
We only know of them because towards the very end of their lives, they start to produce inventories of all the goods they have, and they draft several testaments, several wills, in which they document what they owe, who owes them, and if they have any debts. Together, what we learn from these documents is that uh, Felipe Monzón and Juana Maria de la Cruz came to dominate the market for chile peppers in the city of Puebla. And if you've ever been to Puebla, um, you you will know that so much of our cuisine revolves around chiles. Um, the chile rellenos, the chipotles, the jalapeños, which are one and the same, we know. But it is, it is truly remarkable that this Afro-Indigenous couple was able to network so efficiently um, that they rose to prominence, had a massive residence in the San Jose Barrio, and truly became what I consider to be Afro-Indigenous elites, people who knew how to navigate with Spaniards, but also with the indigenous majorities of Central Mexico, and then with these very significant populations of African descent in the city of Puebla. So for this reason and many more, they are a fantastic case study of the kind of interactions that we haven't studied before in history. And their, their life story allowed me to, to publish that, that first paper on them. And I'm sure there's much more to tell, but we haven't found it quite yet. <laughs> well, I just, I just can't wait to see a, a full documentary. I mean, it's so enticing. And the story of Felipe and Juana is very unique for all sorts of reasons, but it also helps us illustrate a very important common aspect of, of the society. And that is how interracial marriages were one of the ways in which social mobility was achieved. We often tend to think that while this was a very hierarchical and pyramidal society, that there was no mobility. It was very complicated, but there was mobility. And, and it was achieved by people outside the ruling top elites, descendants uh, of Spaniards and peninsular, you know, Spain-born Spaniards. So can you please help us expand this so we can have uh, a better idea of the social dynamics between castas and classes? Okay, so what's what's fascinating about this is that from the very beginning of the colonial period, African men and Native women start to figure out how to play these colonial systems in their favor. So by 1538, for instance, we have African men who are marrying Native women and they claim freedom. And this is very disconcerting to the authorities um, because, of course, they want these colonial subjects to follow religious orthodox catholic expectations and they're doing so but they don't expect them to challenge their legal status uh, so we have a series of letters that cross the atlantic what do we do they're claiming freedom um, and so eventually the crown and the religious authorities decide that well no um, marrying a person of a different uh, ethnicity doesn't necessarily mean that you are a free person but what it did mean in the long term is that any time that an enslaved person, an enslaved man in particular, married a free woman, and that woman had their, their children, um, those children were born free, right? After 1542, all Native people are considered to be free people, legally free, even if they're vassals of the Spanish crown. And so this, this theory of uh, partus sequitur ventrem means that a whole generation of Afro-Indigenous people would be born in freedom to Indigenous women. This to me is fascinating because it means that a lot of our Native history is also deeply entangled with African history. And in time, those mixed families are going to claim freedoms. They're going to become more prominent actors in the colonial sphere. This, of course, completely destabilizes a caste system. If the caste system is about reducing people to certain social niches based on ancestry, then what do you do with these very socially mobile families who, by the way, speak Nahuatl, speak uh, Spanish? Some of them, if they've been educated by friars or whatnot, may even know Latin. And then from the African side, these are people whose Fathers and mothers speak Kikongo and Kimbundu, right? They were truly polyglots. And so that also destabilizes the caste system. It's, it's one of the reasons why that system falls apart in the 17th century. It's because of this Afro-Indigenous link 
that constantly challenges that uh, that kind of positioning that the colonial state wanted to impose. Yeah, in many ways, they really owned a lot more cultural capitals than Spaniards, and they knew literally how to navigate multiple worlds, social worlds and cultures at the same time. Now, going back again to the presence of a well, a very, very well-established and thriving indigenous nobility in Puebla, but in the case of Puebla, also adjacent region of Tlaxcala. You know, the fact that they were still powerful more than 100 years into the colonial period tells us a more complex story about the process of conquest, and like I said at the, at the beginning of the conversation, and settler colonialism in Puebla, uh, which proves that the formation of numerous alliances were key uh, in the strategies of cooperation, muy importante, and survival of indigenous groups. And that's why the story of Juana Maria de la Cruz is a very magnificent example of this. So could you help us understand how this phenomenon occurred of, of these alliances and its importance in the establishment precisely of the city of Puebla, the obrajes, a type of, of uh, organized trades uh, occurred and why there is so little research on the subject? Well, I think it's a wonderful question and, and it does speak to how interconnected and how dependent really Spanish society was on indigenous people. So when we study Puebla, especially, we start to see that these neighborhoods that surrounded the central plaza are really extensions of ethnic states. So the people of Tlaxcala have a neighborhood in Puebla. The people of Cholula have a neighborhood in Puebla. Uh, people from the Mixteca have neighborhoods in Puebla, and so on and so forth. And so uh, Juana Maria's story is one of that enormous Tlaxcalan presence um, and those neighborhoods that are settled on the periphery of Puebla. There's an entire region of the city that in the colonial period is known as Tlaxcaltecapan, right? It's essentially the area of Tlaxcala within the city of Puebla. And so, of course, she's operating within the context of her ethnic state, as it were, and there are often rivalries with other ethnic groups. The people of San Pablo, those were um, migrants from Texcoco in central Mexico, right? So you have a very vibrant, diverse indigenous population. The colonial project is to flatten native people into this category of Indio, right? That flattening. But in reality, that ethnic diversity is very alive in the peripheries of the city of Puebla. You have native families who understand that they need to do business in Puebla in order to keep their political power intact in Cholula, in Huejotzingo, in other indigenous communities. So it's a constant interplay. And these, these ethnic communities, uh, these native communities, um, sometimes they retain this power and even expand it during the colonial period, even if, if overall we know that the Spaniards are controlling the macro, right, the macro situation. Um, I would say that there is a ton of new research being conducted now. It, without a doubt, the leading expert on the native history of Puebla in the colonial period is uh, Professor Lidia Gomez Garcia, who is just um, an incredible, incredible scholar. She's at the Autonomous University of Puebla, and BUAP. And of course, she reads native language documents and sources and has done immense work with the annals of Puebla. Um, and she publishes uh, rather frequently on that. So, so that is the person to follow when we want to reconstruct the indigenous vitality of 16th and 17th century Puebla. Excellent. I'm going to make sure to also include uh, a couple of her papers. We, we sort of touch on religion, and let's go back to it now, because... Beyond the religious missionary narratives, you know, of the presence of the church in colonial Mexico to come and save souls, and da -di -da -di -da, uh, they really have very pragmatic and specific purposes within the public administration. Uh, one of such activities was uh, record keeping, right? Uh, and the Spanish bureaucracy established a long and complex uh, series of uh, processes for almost anything. So that generated ridiculous amounts of documents uh, that survive to this day, well, many of them, uh, which, of course, is gold dust uh, for historical research. You establish in your work that religious bureaucracy was used 
by non-Spanish individuals to legitimize their status and identity. Now, we talk about notarial documents, which are uh, uh, economic transactions. But that's not the only kind of document that can help or did help non-Spanish individuals to legitimize and have a paper trail uh, to testify their movement in society. So can you tell us more about how these type of documents uh, help enslaved and freed and other non-Spanish people to improve their opportunities in life and also how that became core for your research? Certainly. So... What we should remember is that there are no civil registries in the colonial period. The Catholic Church is a civil registry. So anytime that a child is born, well, that's unrecorded. But when that child is baptized, then that produces an entry. So from a very basic level, we can trace the existence of families, um, of children, but also these, these networks that we often miss, right? Compadres, comadres, godparents. These are fictive kin. And what those records allow us to do is to figure out who was the important person in that given society. When you seek a godparent for your child, you're looking for someone of trust, someone that will be able to mediate in that child's favor. And so we start to trace these communities, these Black, African, and mixed communities, and often how they um, transcend ethnic divisions, right? By saying, oh, well, well look, in, in San Jose, it all revolves around Doña Ermila. But in San Pablo, it's about Don Jose, right? And, and so those kind of records give us a different kind of texture, a texture that isn't economic. Um, it's, it's cultural, it's effective. Um, and in the case of uh, families, what we've been able to trace is this idea that, um, that at least some of, of the more successful uh, families of African descent start to claim these ideas of uh, legitimacy. In other words, my mother and my father married in the church in 1620, and I am a legitimate child of these two people. In other words, if the original colonial project is to debase, debase, and debase, now those third-generation families can say, mm-mm, I'm also a legitimate person by your standards. If, if the Christian nuclear family is the ultimate objective, I've been doing that. My family has been doing that for three, four generations. So that starts to complicate how colonial, well, colonizers um, try to stratify society. More and more they can say, look, I've been a member of this parish for generations. And um, here are the records. You can check in the baptismal books. You can check in the death certificates. And certainly, I am worthy of honor and respect. Now, that's an ideal. And there are many people who don't fall within that ideal, right? There, there are many single parent households in the colonial period as well. So there are limits to this. But certainly for those that were able to stabilize and to contest the power of, of religion and the state those marriage instruments became a, a crucial part of their success. Stepping stones for them to move uh, upwards and sideways. No? Earlier on, you touched upon uh, the importance of agriculture, but specifically certain types of, of produce, namely chiles, that were fundamental in the regional economy. Uh, it has a reason why Puebla's uh, culinary legacy and practices to the, the, the enormous dimension and importance they did. Um, there's also cultural reasons, migrations, and obviously trade routes, but also everything that was grown in this region played a key part because that came into our pantries. So Puebla was and still is in many ways a true agricultural powerhouse. And that is what helped establish the region's strategic importance within New Spain because Puebla didn't have uh, mining activity or other types of activity that occurred uh, in other regions of Mexico. So Puebla never had that, but he had an agricultural activity. This is what explains a lot of the social success of Felipe and Juana that was rooted into this exploitation of agriculture. And they, that's what enabled them to become Chile tycoons <laughs> and were able to amass wealth and power. Power, this is more important as well, because they were more than traders. So to know and understand these, can you help us explain who 
actually owned and controlled most of the agricultural activity in the colonial period. Right. So you're absolutely correct. Um, Puebla is the breadbasket, but not just of Mexico. It's of the breadbasket of the Spanish Empire. Um, very close to the city of Puebla, there's a village of Atlisco, and Atlisco became known for its wheat fields, right? These prolific wheat fields that would then be transformed into flour, and then those biscuits would be sent to Florida, to Cuba, to the entire Caribbean basin, to the fleets that went back to Spain, right? So there's this concentration of resources of um, hacendados, essentially hacienda owners, who live in Puebla but own agricultural estates throughout that central Mexican region. And so the concentration of resources is extreme. Um, we can see that in, in terms of uh, things like wheat, it's, it's definitely controlled by Spaniards, but maíz is something different, right? Because of its millenarian history in, in Mesoamerica. So you still have extensive production of corn by native communities because they paid tribute to the Mexica state and to the Tlaxcalan state in, in pre-Hispanic times. And in a sense, the Spaniards simply adopt that and redirect the tribute, that traditional tribute in, in maize and in beans and in other agricultural products into these new colonial urban centers. So we know that on some level, the producers are still the native communities who have always worked the land and still work the land to this day. Um, the case of that we studied earlier is a, is a little bit interesting because it's, it's very clear that uh, Monzon and De La Cruz have a different level of access to Chile and to Chile producers. And because Chile grows very differently than maize and, and, uh, and wheat, it seems to me that there are smaller producers that they are purchasing from. And then those producers are bringing these, in, these enormous bushels of Chile into their residence in San Jose and then to the, to the market in, in, in Puebla's main plaza. It speaks to that, you're right, that economic power that native groups still retained, especially if they could find that intermediary in the city. So that's where you have those interesting actors in the 17th century who really challenge us um, and I think they also challenge these Spanish wholesalers um, rather effectively. There comes a point, uh, to, just to return to Felipe and Juana Maria, where um, you have priests who are indebted to them, right? <laughs> they, they, have such, they have such financial resources that they're loaning out money, and these priests are pawning their personal effects to secure some of these agricultural goods that Felipe and Juana Maria control. So that speaks to that interplay, that negotiation that is that is constant, and that this couple at least was phenomenal at um, at controlling. Yeah, I I really urge people to read that paper because, <clears throat> well, uh, just as another uh, enticing point, they became so powerful and so wealthy that they had really powerful politicians and members of the clergy annotated in their books. Uh, because of the big debts they owe them. Uh, I want to jump a little bit again uh, within the same story of, of this couple, but to another aspect that is not always seen as part of everyday life and problems of central Mexico, which is piracy. In modern Western media, we are very familiar with this romanticized idea of piracy, this imagery of, you know, a world that is populated by adventure seekers and treasure hunters, and uh, they portray the Caribbean and other exoticized shores as pirate uh, playgrounds. Now, the truth is that the history of piracy is anything but romantic. And in fact, it was a very politicized practice where corsairs, buccaneers, pirates and privateers from very many different nationalities sold their services and loyalties to the best bidder and often benefited as well from the slave trade. So this is going to be fantastic. Can you tell us how pirate attacks in Veracruz at the Caribbean ended up at the center of one of the most interesting twists in the life of our hero, Felipe Monzon? So Felipe Monzon, towards the end of his life, has accrued so much influence 
that he is named a captain of one of these pardo militias, right? These these semi-military units that could police the area when when different crises uh, arise. And um, in eighty three, in in I should say May of sixteen eighty three, uh, Felipe Monzon uh, receives news that there has been a devastating pirate attack on the port of Veracruz. If we read the native accounts, the native annals, uh, Los Anales, uh, we see that this was a catastrophic event, right? For two weeks, the pirates raid Veracruz. Uh, they abduct uh, 1,500 people from the port and, and simply take them, take them into the Caribbean. And so Felipe has to uh, produce some sort of a response, right? Organize the Pardo militia, and there's another man who organizes the Moreno militia uh, in response to that attack, because the idea is that people from all around the vice royalty have to now go assist Veracruz. It sounds exceptional, but the reality is that this was rather common in the 17th century. If one lived in a coastal community along uh, the Gulf of, uh, of Mexico, the, the threat of a pirate raid, a buccaneer raid, was a constant. And so we have this vision of the Jack Sparrow, Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, rum-toting, um, more comic element to it. But the reality is that coastal communities in, in 17th century Mexico were constantly attacked by French buccaneers, English buccaneers, Dutch buccaneers. This is constant, especially the port of Campeche. Campeche suffers four devastating raids in a 20-year period. It's just, it's catastrophic. What is very interesting and how this intertwines with our story is that pirates were often looking for people of African descent in the sense that they understood that regardless of their status in Mexico, it didn't matter if they were free, it didn't matter if they were Afro-Indigenous, that they could capture said people and they could sell them in the Caribbean as enslaved beings. And that's exactly what happened in Veracruz, right? So you have this massive raid and we have this extraction of Afro-Mexican people who were mostly taken to San Domingue, today's Haiti, but also to South Carolina in the United States, now, now in the United States. Um, and this affected the Afro-Mexican population deeply because as is still the case, if you live in Puebla, you probably have a relative in Veracruz. And so that community was devastated. It hit Poblanos especially hard. And so that May 1683 raid is, is the, the subject of my next uh, monograph project. But it's, but it's a way of complicating how we think of piracy, blackness, belonging, our connections to Caribbean people, um, but through an African diasporic lens. I contend that we're very, very deeply connected and that the most powerful source, by the way, the most powerful source for that entire history is the one of a native chronicler who lived in the city of Puebla, who describes the crying, the weeping, the emotions that people in Puebla felt when they heard about the attack on Veracruz. So there's much more we could say about that, but we, we may need another two hours for that one. <laughs> well, when, when that paper is out, you're going to have all of my time, obviously. And uh, do we know what happened then? Uh, what was the aftermath of that? Did they recover those people? Uh, so thank you for that question, because most people are usually content with, oh, there was an attack. And I, and I think the real story is what happened after. Um, and what happens after is that those women that are taken from Veracruz become the mothers to the first mixed race people of Haiti. I contend that the Jean de Coulot of Haiti have Mexican mothers, Afro-Mexican mothers. Um, we think that of those 1,500 people who were taken, I found evidence that perhaps 200 were eventually rescued. But for the most part, that Afro-Veracruzano community went into another diaspora, into the Caribbean and into the southern United wow. States. Again, I'm, I'm going to save my personal story for last week. Now, uh, heading into this third part of the of, our, of the conversation, I want to actually go into the process of your own research and the challenges that you uh, came across. Because as people might be wondering already, 
this is not your average topic and these are not the average type of challenges because, you know, there are so many things that you have to sort out, not just uh, the state of uh, archives, uh, but also, I guess, the, the reluctance of people to even accept what, what you were proposing is relevant today, but also very provocative. It's very creative and indeed is a poignant reminder of the need to continue questioning the rationalized cultural narratives that we still have uh, today uh, that have been created in Mexico for, you know, uh, hundreds of years and, and recreated, which are a reflection of coloniality in all its splendor. And likewise, uh, you're, you're aiming to change the perspectives about Mexico that exist outside Mexico. Well, you have shared it in some of your works uh, many issues that you have come across uh, that prevent historical research from taking a more critical approach. Which are these issues that prevent a critical approach and why it's important to generate critiques about the way Mexican identities and otherness have been studied and presented? So I would say that the first answer to that question is that in Mexico, we, we are no longer taught our colonial history. We, we just aren't instructed in, on those 300 years of history. Um, this happens at a federal level, unfortunately. Um, we are taught that um, there were native people here first. We were native people here first. And then the Spaniards came and conquered us. That's a narrative. And Cortes was a bad person. And then we leap 300 years to 1821 and to independence. What happened in those 300 years? We're not really sure. And when we do that, we essentially erase all the complexity that we've been describing we erase Asian populations, we erase African populations, we erase those native populations that managed to survive and adapt and thrive, right? So, so we, we lose our, our, our Jewish population, certainly Muslim, right? So it, it's, it's a convenient exercise in miseducation. And that is, that is I think internally with, within the Mexican context, that is a root issue. Uh, Ursula Camba Ludlow has a wonderful book called Echoes of New Spain, Echoes de la Nueva España, where she charts the fascinating histories that we have, but only if we care to look at those 300 years. I would say that when it comes to generating critiques, then we're battling with other demons. We're, we're battling with the demons of the early 20th century with the ideas of, um, of Vasconcelos, who was very deeply influenced by the eugenic movement, um, by these racialist ideas, uh, this notion of the cosmic race, we tend to evaluate that positively. Oh, we all come together. We are mixed. We are a superior cosmic race of mixed peoples. And when we read Vasconcelos carefully, he is trying to eliminate certain strands. He writes very despectively of African populations, of Asian populations. He wants indigenous populations to disappear. So we're dealing with that legacy, which is very deeply built into the things that we celebrate today. We celebrate our, our pyramids and our Aztec temples, but we don't really think about how those communities lived in the colonial period in the 19th century, 20th, and now in the 21st. Um, in terms of why it's important to generate these critiques, we have to give ourselves the possibilities to be more complex. If, if, if you find through your family history that you have ancestors from Congo, that should allow you to have a different relationship with the world and with the people of Congo, right? Understanding that, yes, we are... Mexicans, for the most part, we are deeply mixed people. There are certainly indigenous populations that have not. But for the most part, the population has all sorts of intermixture, cultural, racial, linguistic. So why would we not allow us that opportunity to engage uh, a Senegalese community productively? Why, why would we stop that, right? And, and I think that when we start to consider the possibilities of our past and how we've been formed culturally, then that enables very, very different readings of our future. Um, so our representations have to start to change. When we say that you know Mexico is a result of the clash of two cultures, uh, 
I would say, well, there was also a very, very important African culture. Can we speak about a third culture? If we're studying the Pacific coast of Mexico, would we not have to necessarily think about Filipino people and their contribution to to those regions? So, so we have to break away from these clash mentalities and start to really factor for the complexity of, of who we are. Um, and, and Rocio, you know this better than anyone. In terms of food, we are a global composite. And there's no way of understanding ourselves without acknowledging that, yes, of course, the indigenous element is essential. The European element is essential. And then there are other things that make us essential. And we, we just have to be open to that, um, to the possibility that the 20th century denied us. Um, we, we can think more broadly. Yes, yes. I'm cheering here. All of these uh, critique of how history has been flattened has all sorts of consequences. Not only, like you say, has denied us the possibility to, to think our past, our present, and our relationship with you know, our, our global communities in a completely different way, it has disenfranchised also living, breathing Indigenous communities uh, and, and just focusing on the visual legacy of the past through uh, structures such as pyramids and archaeological sites while denying the visibility of the problems and ways uh, in which indigenous communities continue uh, being oppressed is absolutely important if we try to build a a more just society. That is the importance of historical studies. It's not the past. History has so much to do with our future. And I think that is the generational shift that you are representing here in in this new school of thought of ethno-history. Because in Mexico, for many political reasons, history has only been focused on the past very conveniently. And and now, like you say, we need to force ourselves to have these difficult uh, conversations. And you just briefly touched and just threw this bombshell of uh, eugenics. And (laughs) I actually came across a lot of documents about the Mexican or several of the Mexican eugenic societies uh, during this last summer when I have uh, spent several weeks doing archival research uh, for a colleague that was doing some uh, paid archival research uh, at the Historical Archive of the City of Mexico and also the Archivo General de la Nación uh, in the Conberri, which is Mexico's most important documented historical repository. And while I was able to make, you know, incredible, surprising findings, I was also very, very shocked at the many problems I encountered uh, in the archives themselves that went from what you said early, very early on, lost documents, poor or non-existent catalogs, antiquated databases or no databases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But also, I have to say, I was very pleasantly surprised by the willingness to help and the professionalism of many archivists. You have had your fair share of these with your own work. Uh, and, and, you know, you encountered real sorts of challenges. So there are many of your colleagues, uh, whether they're Mexican or American or, or you know, non-Mexicans that, that are hoping or planning to come to Mexico and do archival research. Uh, what is your advice for that? Okay. So the... <laughs> This this is such a loaded question. So I would say that the, the the first thing one has to do is to arm themselves with so much patience, so much love for the work that you do, and to the understanding that you will not see the things that you want to see during the day that you had planned that you were going to see them. Um, but, but but that aside, I think there has to be a real engagement with the scholarship of the people that you are trying to study. So so what that means is if if you're coming from the outside and you want to develop a history of a given facet of Poblano history, you need to write those historians who reside in Puebla, who, who are constantly there, who are part of the local fabric of society, because more often than not, they know the things that you are looking for. They have those conversations with those archivists. They often know about these secret little collections that have never been cataloged, but that you perhaps can access if you were asked the right people, if you if you come in with the right uh, um, 
framework. Um, I, I would say that the internet has given us immense possibilities, right? The fact that, um, well, this podcast is a perfect example. Right, that we can deepen our knowledge of something that perhaps physically was inaccessible to us for any number of reasons. Right, so so that means you can reach out to scholars on Academia Edu. You can reach out to the student university uh, studying networks, right, and say, "Hey, is anyone working on uh, the Black community of Tehuacan?" Right, that kind of interactivity is is now actually quite possible. I do think that going forward, for for this kind of scholarship to succeed, we have to be better about digitizing and making it accessible. It is often very difficult to enter an archive, and guess what? The hours of consult are only from ten a.m. to one p.m. That's hard to do. If if you have children, if you have obligations to your family, to your work, that's a very difficult schedule to accommodate. But the more that we digitize and we share our research, the more we're going to thrive. And I think that's a shift that I've seen in the last five years. The idea that, okay, I have my database, it's mine, it's mine, but it really only matters if I share it. Um, that is going to take us to new places. Um, I know that, for instance, the National Archive of Mexico, the AGN, is leading this initiative for um, this website called Memoria Historica, Historical Memory, where they're digitizing thousands of documents and transcribing them, and they're going up free of charge so that everyone can access them. That is going to change how we think of ourselves, of our past, and our future. Um in terms of <laughs> what challenges have I met? So many, so many. I had to go to some masses. I had to go to church a few more times than I was used to, to prove that, you know, I'm here on Sunday. I should be able to come to the archive on Tuesday. Um, I had to produce triplicate uh, forms in order to access a certain governmental archive. Um it is an exercise in patience, I will say that. But I've also come to appreciate the archivists and the secretaries who have guarded these papers for generations and who are very careful, very, very careful that one is not um, damaging those documents. And so those conversations actually in the archive, um, in the Sagrario Parish, some of my best memories of Puebla are those conversations with... La Señorita Gavi, um, who've become lifelong friends because we're always there. We're always in the parish archive together. So the patience comes with its rewards, I, I promise you. <laughs> and, uh, well, again, if my question was loaded, your answer uh, was uh, <laughs> matching it. <clears throat> and, and trying to unpack one of those things, uh, which we sort of previously commented prior to today, is... Um, my practice on behalf of historians, uh, which is also part of the reality why, why I mean, there is a reason why you are saying we need to share, we need to socialize our research, we need to put it out there to be found. What is the purpose of putting so much work if you are not sharing it in order to help further? Rewriting history, challenging history is not an individual effort, is a societal endeavor. And as such, it should be shared and equally maintain a standard. Uh, so one of the most shocking and very sad things I encountered regarding these documental research is when I was planning my own visit to the archives. So what I did was reading papers, reading books, and then going to the to the original sources, you know, what they cited, and then trying to find that, which is, you know, what you should do anyways, right? I, what I found is that there was a lot of malpractice on behalf of well-known Mexican and American scholars whose names will remain anonymous, of course. But what I found is that they deliberately used fake or incomplete citations in their papers, in their books, of the archival resources that they consulted. Now, whether it was because of they were, you know, they were uninterested, they were careless, or they did it deliberately uh, just to be petty, I thought it was unacceptable and speaks very, very poorly also of peer-reviewed publications and, and, and these academic journals that publish their work because they did not do their homework and they did not make sure that whatever sources they consulted were actually truthful. 
Now, I really urge researchers to be very, very careful and ethical about this. And I don't. I, I wonder if you've come across these type of problems. And you know, you as a, as an academic as well, uh, you know, have have a way of of um, warning and educating your students about the ways we can raise awareness about this and prevent it. So, um, have you experienced these? Right. So, what I've experienced more often than not are, are historians who are very guarded. Of, of their scholarship and um, don't want it to be contested, right? So um, prominent figures in the field who will remain nameless, um, who will make a fantastic claim about something, and I'll go to the end note, I'll go to the footnote, and I'll find that it's a reference to a massive 4,000-page bundle, which essentially makes it impossible to verify the claim. And so there are ways to combat this, of course. One is to simply demand of our peers and and of our students and of our professors, um, be truly specific. I want to be able to second and celebrate and build upon your research, but I need to know that there's a foundation of trust, that I can actually rely on what you claim you have found. So that means... It means being annoying. It means what folio did you find this on? What page, right? What it is? It is simply unacceptable to say go to the archive of the Indies, to the Contaduría records, and look for Mexico two seventy. That's not acceptable, and it should no longer be acceptable. I think the other thing we have to do, personally, as we do our research, is we have to be much more attentive to the primary source. That has really changed how I approach my entire discipline, um, I am careful now to transcribe documents completely and then to make that transcription a living part of a, of a given study. Because I want you to see what the language is like. I want you to see the inconsistencies. And I think it's really important for our students to understand that what I am reading in a certain way, you can read in a very different light it doesn't have to challenge my interpretation, but certainly it can give you a new dimension to understand our past. So I've become an advocate of provide an appendix, provide the original source. And if you want to translate it, that's perfectly fine. But that has to be included more and more in our studies. Um, I have a bilingual documentary history coming out next year. And it's about that. It's about empowering a student to say, well, Professor Sierra sees it in this way, but I actually come at it from a, from a very different economically focused angle. Ah, perfecto, that's fine. But if we don't have the dialogue, then we kill the entire point of producing these studies. So let's democratize our sources. Let's actually share them and see what happens. <laughs> yes. I, I absolutely wholeheartedly support that. And I know that uh, you advocate about these and many other things as a professor. And everything that we've discussed today, well, it is a very, very broad topic and very complex and has many layers and it expands and it continues to, to be a part of our present and we continue to be a part of our future. If we sort of drill down, and like I try to make this exercise to, to boil it down to, the, to, to what lays underneath you know, all of this research that you're doing, the studies about race, the studies about enslavement, the stories about invisibilized people. It took me to this, so let me try it and phrase it. You have explored, among other things, the changing conditions and agency of enslaved African and Afro-descendant people in Puebla, also intertwined that with indigenous history, of course. This case of Puebla uh, might give us an idea of how similar processes may have occurred uh, across Mexico. You know, these type of uh, societal tensions, these type of social mobility, these type of cases where, where some of these people were able to acquire and build for themselves a, a very important position in, in their societies. Now, having said that, the abolition of slavery uh, in Mexico, which officially was declared in 1813, sets a time period that is very debatable. When we were preparing this episode, you pointed out that indeed 1813 
is the date when, when, of course, the publication of this key document, which is the Sentimientos de la Nación by Jose Maria Morelos y Pavón, is important uh, in the fact that it invokes, you know, it, it puts there the idea of the abolition of slavery. But the actual end of it, at least on paper, occurred much later in 1829. There is a reason why there is an emphasis now in on paper, because that's exactly what happened in the US. On paper, 1865. Now, in my opinion, in neither of both cases, the abolition of slavery was motivated by a moral or ideological shift. I think it was rather the fact that slavery became economically less functional and operational for their society. That is my my one of my reads, anyways. In Mexico, I don't think there has been a moment of reckoning about our participation in the slave trade. We look at the U.S. and we're like, oh yeah, you were a slave trader. Oh yeah, slavery. Oh, it was so bad. But no, no, here in Mexico, didn't I mean we minimize it, we flatten it, we invisibilize it. You know, the the widespread practice of of slave ownership and human suffering and abuse that came with it is something that is not acknowledged in Mexico. Are we ready to have that conversation? Am I correct in reading this in the right way? Where do we go from here? Well, loaded question number two. Uh, I would say that we are not yet ready for that conversation. Um we still have this uh, reluctance to believe that African people lived in Mexico. We are still very reluctant to even understand that our own family histories are deeply entwined with the African diaspora. Um, I think there is progress being made. Um, There's been a lot of debate about the 2015 and then the 2020 federal census in which Afro-Mexicanos, Afro-Descendientes have finally been recognized at the, at the federal level. We have statistical counts now of where those, con- those Black populations are, are most concentrated. And I think consciousness building is a very slow process, right? It, it's, it, it's decades in the making. Um, certainly, uh, we, we talked about the historiography and In the English side of things, a Jamaican scholar, Colin Palmer, was the one who really spearheaded English language research on Afro-Mexicans in 1977, right? So there's like a 50-year lag, (laughs) 45-year lag here at play. But I think we are making steady progress in terms of um, really thinking and arriving at that moment of reckoning. I think there are two main things that we have to address. One is the transatlantic slave trade to Mexico ends very, very early, right? You can compare it to any other space in in the Western Hemisphere. Brazil is still active in the 1850s, okay? In Mexico, by 1700, it's becoming difficult to speak of a transatlantic slave trade. So that's one. We, We are centuries removed from it. The other one is that um, by the time that Mexico becomes a nation, an independent nation in 1821, it's an overwhelmingly free country. And that's where your point about, you know, what motivated that uh, abolition, that abolitionist statement is right. Ben Vincent, who you spoke about before, and Herbert Klein, they say, look, you have to understand for every enslaved person, in Mexico, at the end of the 1700s, there were 30 free people. So more and more, the history of Afro-Mexicans is a history of freedom. Here we've been talking about slavery because we simply don't acknowledge it, but we're largely talking about the history of free populations. So that moment of reckoning, I think, is, is different in and should be different in Mexico than in the United States and in Cuba and in Brazil. Um, the other element that's fascinating, and um, I was just speaking about this with uh, a good friend from Veracruz, Alvaro Alcantara, is he's saying, look, some of the leaders of the Afro-Mexicanist movement today are also indigenous people. They are Afro-indigenous people because the communities are so intertwined. So you can speak for a given native community and also speak for an African descended community in the Costa Chica because the histories are together. And so 
as long as we're willing to acknowledge that complexity, I think we're going to be okay. We're arriving at a new moment for sure. Uh, Medin Tewol de Serrano is a brilliant filmmaker, um, and she put out a documentary called Negra um, two or three years ago. And it gets at that complexity and how people of Afro-Indigenous descent are now starting to think, well, do I feel more Afro-descendient there or do I feel more indígena or do I simply feel like a citizen in 21st century Mexico? So as long as we don't fall into binaries, I'm this or I'm that, I think we're going to be okay. Um, the work has to happen educationally. We have to rethink that um, that federal template that we spoon feed Mexican children. Um, and then in terms of the abuse and where do we go from here? Um, we are doing some things right. We're celebrating Afrodescendiente cultures a lot more, right? This, this acknowledgement, not just of, oh, Yanga, Gaspar Yanga was a legendary Maroon leader. No, no, no. What does Gaspar Yanga mean for central Veracruz and southern Veracruz? And let's talk about those communities. And let's think about their cuisines and their musical culture. And that's part of the patrimony of the Mexican state now. And that challenges, of course, the national state. Some of these conversations mean it's not about Mexico anymore. It's about connecting African diasporic communities. So how we lead these conversations depends on our objective. And I'm not saying that there's a solution to any of this. All I'm saying is that if we keep pretending that these African communities did not exist, if we keep pretending that they don't exist today, which we can't say anymore because we can speak to 2.5 million people, at least in the last census, that then, then it changes. Um, so this Mexico multicultural, this, Mexi this multicultural Mexico, um, it has some promise and we will certainly stumble. There will be some pitfalls, but I do think we're making sustained progress towards acknowledging what this deep, deep history means. Well, I was just going to say one thing real quick because you mentioned Morelos and, and I forgot about this. Um, Morelos was a man of African descent, partial African descent, had all sorts of things. And the concern at that time in 1813 was that people of, of African descent were taxed very highly. They, they, had, they were the population that paid most taxes out of anyone in Mexico. So when Morello says we're going to abolish slavery and we're going to abolish caste distinctions, it means he wants to stop being taxed unjustly. And that meant that for Afro-Mexicans in that period, it was better for them to move away from those labels that had always discriminated them. It wasn't a rejection of their blackness or their Africanness. It wasn't that. It was wanting to be more equal participants in civic society. And when Vicente Guerrero reaffirms the abolition of slavery in 1829, it's that same motivation. So there's that. There are some other things that we're not going to talk about because of time. But um, my point was that African diasporic communities also have different objectives. And those will shift Those will shift with time. And if we're right now in a moment of Afrodescendientes and Afromexicanos, that's great. In 2,220, they may have very different objectives as well. Uh, and Vicente Guerrero is very important, of course, uh, because he is our first and only uh, Afrodescendiente who uh, was president of Mexico. Um, oh, yeah. So I, I, I'm a, a weird product of uh, colonialism. I am the great great granddaughter of indigenous Tlaxcalan people became like indigenous landed gentry. So they had a big agricultural state in Zacatelco, Tlaxcala, and they they produced uh, wheat and uh, corn. So they owned haciendas, which in a very Mexican fashion uh, were lost during the Mexican Revolution. So yes, I, um, I don't have anything. Uh, there is the presence of an, an orphan, a child, uh, a girl from the French invasion in 1862 
who ended up stranded and was uh, uh, just, you know, sort of saved by my family. I'm also a descendant of that. And this is just my dad's side. I'm also the descendant of uh, people who uh, worked on the sugar cane industry uh, in the 1800s. They own uh, sugar cane uh, plantations and also mills uh, in El Naranjal in Veracruz and in Alvarado, Veracruz. And my great great grandfather was nicknamed El Negro, El Negro Zamorano, because lo and behold, he was a big, big man, upper descendant with no idea where his lineage come from. And then uh, one of his daughters married an, a Spanish, an Asturian immigrant who came with nothing, you know, uh, escaping poverty in, in Spain in the 1800s, comes here. And so marrying the daughter of this mulatto man, and he pretty much built the whole town of Alvarado, Veracruz, he built the church, he built schools. And for the record, uh, I don't, my family doesn't own any of that. Everything was lost to, you know, bad admin and what have you. And, and, and we have nothing. We have ourselves and that's fine. Uh, but, <laughs> but like through my veins runs all this history. So, I mean, for me to read the story uh, of Felipe and Maria, it touches me on a very personal level because I know so little of these very ancient and distant uh, African and indigenous origins. And, and it's very exciting for me to see, to see myself reflected in their history. Um, and, I, I, and when you say that that should create different ways for people to engage with their history and their present and their identities, I am living proof of that. Your work has impacted me on a personal level because of that and has given me back some of the lost history of my family. And um, thank you for that. <laughs> well, Rocio, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. And um, I have to say, there's going to be a lot more of this. There's a whole generation of new young scholars trained in Mexico, trained in the U.S., trained globally. Who, who want to further these histories and i think that as long as we as long as we keep their humanity in focus we are going to get better and so when i when i close my book in the last chapter of my book i say that um that we need to say their names right that they had names some of them had african names that we have lost um and some of them have very, very interesting names that allow us to build connections to them. And that's how I end my book. I say, we need to say Maria de Terranova. We need to say Felipe Monzón. Uh, we need to say Lázaro Rodríguez. Um, and it's only by humanizing them because once we do that, then then we understand that they very well could have been our ancestors. They very well are our ancestors and then that must forcibly make us um be more empathetic people and you're right history is for the future it's it's not for the past um so we we study the past to build better futures for ourselves um so thank you thank you for this opportunity to share uh with your audience and um to talk about puebla and um to deepen some of what we think we know and hopefully someone will come and correct us in a few years and tell us that we had it all wrong. And that will mean that we have built a productive dialogue. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I'm going to put your uh, university's email address, the link to your profile in um, ResearchGate and in academia, uh, where people can find your papers, your work and follow you. Please do so because Pablo is a darling and he will get back to you and he is very generous. And don't hesitate reaching out, as he said, you know, uh, we are here, people who are doing research. Uh, there's nothing more important for us uh, than to, to, to share. So reach out, reach out, people. Pablo, muchísimas gracias por todo. Thank you very much. And all success and power to you. Thank you so much, Rocio. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening.
This episode was researched, produced, and presented by me, Rocío Carvajal. For those interested in knowing more about Pablo's work and the topic of Afro-Mexico, the history of slavery in the Americas, and other related topics, I have put together a long list of resources for you that include the recommendations that Pablo mentioned during our conversation. And among these materials, you can find Pablo's own book, um, Urban Slavery in Colonial Mexico, Puebla de Los Angeles, 1531-1706, um, published by Cambridge Latin American Studies. Episode 77 of this podcast that is called Afro Andalusí Culinary Legacy in Mexico, a link to the amazing podcast Kingdom, Empire, and Plus Ultra, Conversations on the History of Portugal and Spain, 1415-1898. And also, uh, there is a fabulous paper uh, published by UNESCO called Legacies of Slavery, a resource book for managers of sites and itineraries of memory. And there's, like I said, a really, really long list of gorgeous material. So check that out. But if you have any other questions, comments or nice things to say, you can reach out to me on social media. You can find me and the show on Twitter and Instagram. The links are there for you. You can drop me a line to hello at positivebotle.com. If you enjoy this show, well, you can show your support by uh, helping me continuing doing this by recommending it to your friends, writing a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to help others discover it. And you can also buy my ebooks, which are on my digital stand. The links for that are in the description as well. Well, I think that's it for me today. Take care. Until the next time.